Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, my name is Nikos Chrysoloras. Uh, I'm a senior reporter at Bloomberg News uh, covering uh, European and global stock markets. So thank you for joining us in this uh, final session of uh, the Delphi Economic Forum, where we're going to discuss on how to build a, a competitive and efficient capital market uh, trusted by investors. Uh, Joining me today in, the, in our panel is uh, Vasily Lazaraku, Chair of the Hellenic, uh, the Hellenic Capital Markets Commission. Nicolas Faf, Deputy CEO and uh, Head of Sustainable Finance at the International Capital Market Association. And uh, uh, joining us online is uh, Serdar Selik, Director at the OECD's uh, Directorate for Financial and Enterprise uh, Affairs. I would just like to start this discussion by framing the topic a bit. Uh, why is it even important beyond the, the bubble of uh, you know, uh, fixed income investors and equity investors, why is it even important um, to build a competitive uh, and efficient capital market? What's in it for us, for taxpayers, for consumers, for Main Street businesses? Uh, um, uh, and the rest of us. Uh, uh, Nicolas, do you want to take this one? And I, I can try. <laughs> I can try. Uh, l let me start by first thanking the, the forum for, for inviting us and, and for the opportunity, and also thanking all of you in the room who stayed on. I mean, this is the last session of the day after four days, so thank you for being here. I was a bit worried that we wouldn't have much of an audience, so mm -hmm. this, is, this mm -hmm. is not bad. Uh, <laughs> coming back to the to, to, to the question, yeah, I, I think, you know, for those of us who, who are, you know, as Vizidik and myself are, are directly involved with the markets, you know, the, the, the question uh, sort of seems obvious, but it's, it's, it's sure that when you get into the bigger context uh, and, and you look at the, you know, the population at large, this question of, well, why do markets matter comes up. Um, now, I could give you a very long answer. I'll try to give you a short introductory one. But... You know, you know, let's take the context in Greece. Um, you know, I was, I was here at the time of the crisis. Um, and, you know, I think we found that when markets didn't work, you know, this had a direct impact on the well-being of everyone, uh, not just the economic actors, but all the way to, you know, people who are working. And so, um, you know, clearly the markets play a vital role in financing the economy, financing large companies. Um, they play a vital role in financing the sovereigns, financing governments, and also, perhaps less well understood, they play a key role in financing the banking system. Now, again, when you're working in you know, those entities, I think it seems obvious. Now, when you go down in the economy and you look at medium-sized companies, you then get into this question of, well, you know, do the markets matter? And I think in the experience of smaller companies, what really matters is their relationship with their bank. And in fact, the European economy is characterized by you know, a much higher, higher proportion of the economy being financed by the banking sector vis-a-vis -vis the markets. And you know, I've been party to several discussions in the, in the European context saying, well, shouldn't we attract smaller companies into the markets, particularly into the bond markets? And, and the answer, I think, to be honest, is probably not, because in fact, banks are much better suited to deal with smaller companies in terms of the ability to focus on you know, smaller entities and have a direct dialogue. Now, what's been interesting, I think, in the last decade in Europe is we've developed, I think, markets which both on the equity and on the fixed income side are good at dealing with medium-sized companies. So we no longer have this such a big dichotomy between you know, what the big companies, sovereigns, banks will experience in the markets vis-a-vis growth companies, medium companies, and I could mention you know, specialized markets like the private placement market in Europe, which is you know, products like the EuroPP in France or the Schulschein in Germany, and those are sort of for, for medium-sized companies. And, and um, you know, in the equity markets, we have a diversity across Europe of markets that are focused on growth companies, on smaller companies, on technology, and so I think there's been actually a lot of progress. Now, I'll stop there because I've probably given you more of a, 
an, a, a context you, than you wanted. It's but. interesting that you mentioned, well, I remember this that, that time, eh, I was a reporter that, you know, markets, capital markets were not really functioning in Greece, but this is, this is, this is really changing now. They're becoming more popular, uh, right? Uh, Actually, yes. Uh, yeah. Actually, I have to say that last year, was, first, before I start with uh, what happened last year, let me uh, thank uh, the uh, organizers, Mr. Tomokos, for this excellent organization of, uh, of the Delphi Forum. And uh, I think uh, I, I'm also happy that we have people in the audience. So uh, let me say that last year, and you can see the link with the general economic environment of Greece, last year was really a year of growth. In, uh, in Greece, uh, in the market, we, there was a capital raising of six billion, which is compared to previous years, is like five times before uh, more than, uh, let's say, last year or the year before, and 10 times more the years before. So you see how this is linked with the economy, which is right now we are, fa we are, we are in a phase of a recovery of the Greek economy. Plus, there is very, something very interesting. Uh, what is this? The, 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 the trust of the Greek investors now in the Greek investment funds. Until now, we saw that the Greeks were investing in foreign mutual funds for many reasons. Basically, because of the problems in the past with the economy, because they're going to make sure that they invest in foreign funds so they have their money somehow abroad. Now, we see that for the first time in uh, 2021, we saw that there was a shift. And there were, uh, the, the money invested in the Greek, in the Greek for, sorry, uh, mutual funds were more than the money invested in foreign funds, which shows something, shows that this is together economy and capital markets have to uh, work together. And if you have a uh, capital markets that is really uh, growing, then the same is with the economy and, the, and vice versa. Right. Still, I mean, Greece remains, okay, the capital market, it's becoming, it's becoming more popular, but it's still, a, you know, it's a small market. And I, I, I would like to ask Sir Dar, for, for policy makers, and also for you at the OECD, what are the most, you know, important policy measures that you can take to, to, to help smaller peripheral markets to improve the, the functioning uh, you know, of, the, of the capital markets? Yeah. Thank you, Nikos, for the question. Uh, I am uh, not the director of the Financial Markets Enterprise Directorate in the OECD because Mr. Deloya was supposed to be there with you due to family circumstances. He was not able to travel. I am the head of the Corporate Governance and Corporate Finance Division in Mr. Dinoya's directorate. I'm very pleased to be with you. Uh, uh, in terms of, of course, the, uh, from a capital markets perspective, just also maybe to respond to your first question, there, there are two, at least two important functions here. Now, one is, uh, the, of course, financing the, the, the corporate sector, financing the investments. But what we saw, and this was very important during the, during the crisis period, 2000, let's say, 21, 22, uh, during the COVID crisis, of course, regulators, authorities, they were trying to keep the markets open so that they can continue financing the economy. And I think it worked very well, both in terms of the equity market and the bond market. So the inter also from a non-financial company perspective, the highest amount of issues, three, almost $3 trillion globally, corporate bond issuance, almost $2 trillion equity issuance. But what was the, a bit the important part, always, all, uh, there's already some good developments from growth companies' access to finance, but what was really a bit worrying from us OECD's perspective, access to capital market financing by first-time issues, both in the equity and the bond, it was almost at the lowest levels over the last 10, 20 years. So a lot of money was raised, but not mainly companies uh, new companies, but also already companies that were using the market. So, of course, it shows how important uh, keeping markets open during the resilient, uh, during the crisis uh, periods. But it was not exactly perfect for the growth companies in many markets. There were some parts of Europe, as we know, uh, growth company financing per, uh, almost uh, works much better than uh, in the past. But still, during the crisis, we have seen a bit of uh, challenges, but which is changing now. And in terms of what can be, uh, be done, we have done a lot of work also with the European Commission, individual countries. We are doing capital market reviews and giving uh, uh, recommendations to individual governments. We work with Italy, Portugal, we are working with Romania now. Of course, one problem from, a, let's say, a small company perspective, 
many companies were not aware of the availabilities. Uh, like, what does it mean? How to access financing? So one aspect was always creating awareness. The other part we saw a big kind of a relatively problem in Europe compared to other more developed capital markets is the low interest of retail investors in in the market. Uh, there was the participation rate is usually lower. And one thing, of course, is uh, very much related to protecting investors, not having a strong uh, investor protection mechanism. Uh, I think these are the three things maybe I can highlight at the beginning. Thank you very much. I think also Greece is, is, is taking measures to make its capital markets more attractive, uh, overhauling its regulatory framework. Uh, do, do you want to, uh, to elaborate a bit on, this, on, the, on the most recent uh, changes? Actually, yes. Uh, let me say that uh, uh, as regulator, we, we, we must have three goals, let's say, three targets. Two, actually, is according to the law, but I will add one more. The one, of course, is uh, to have a market that, smooths, that operates smoothly. The other one is to have protection of investors, as I also mentioned. It's very important, this. And the third, uh, the third one that I would add is to make sure that the market is adjusting to the developments, to the structural developments that, that are taking place. For example, the use of technology that is right now in the, in the way uh, services are offered. So what we have done from the, in the last couple of years is that we have taken some strategic decisions on how to, uh, to let's say, make sure that we uh, conform that to, to satisfy the three uh, goals. So the first one was to try to see, to put forward another law. We, we tried to see whether there is national legislation that needed to be uh, amended. So, because I'm saying national legislation, because in the capital markets, most of the legislation is EU legislation. We have the regulations, we have the directors, so we, there is not really national legislation left. But we still have the corporate governance that is national legislation. Mm -hmm. And what we did is that we tried to, we put forward a proposal for changing uh, the corporate governance uh, in Greece, which uh, was uh, voted. And since last year, since uh, July, uh, 2021 is now implemented in Greece. And the Capital Market Commission was there in order to help the listed companies understand the law and try to see how they can implement it in practice. And the, the, the special, let's say, characteristic of this law, first of all, it is in alignment with the EU and the OECD principles. And <laughs> apart from that, uh, tries to enhance, let's say, the internal control mechanism. Why? Because we wanted to make sure that uh, we don't uh, leave again, let's say, past the uh, problems that used to uh, be in the market. And the second uh, very important thing regarding national legislation is to see whether there is any room, for, let's say, for products. So we, uh, uh, we adapted a new AIF because there was not in the Greek market. So plus, of course, we did some regulatory changes, which is in, uh, in order, let's say, to expedite the approval process for the prospectuses in case of, say, capital increases or for bond issuances. So what we did is that we took, we adapted regulatory decisions, which really simplified the process, uh, stopped the bureaucracy that used to exist. Uh, we also uh, accepted the prospectus in English. So we did a lot of, uh, let's say, structural reforms in order to make sure that we have a market which is more, uh, uh, let's say, an environment which is more market friendly. Yeah, and this is obviously in line with the OECD's work on, uh, on uh, reviewing uh, uh, the principles of, uh, of corporate governance. Uh, uh, so that, w why are you doing this review and what is the objective uh, here? Uh, thank you. Thank you very, of course, very good question to follow up also with what was discussed already in the context of Greece. So we see these corporate governance principles were originally developed in 1999. And what happened in 2015, they were endorsed also by G20 leaders. Uh, I mean, maybe you may know, OECD has 38 member countries, but many G20 countries, China, India, South Africa, or Brazil, they are not members of the OECD. But in 2015, they also endorsed these principles as global standards. So now uh, 50, let's say 51, 52 countries, all OECD and G20 countries in, uh, agreed last year in April, said, let's take into account what happened during the COVID crisis, digital transformation, increased risks. Also look at the structural changes in the capital markets. There were some worries in some countries, especially in many developed countries. For example, as you may know, US had 9,000 listed companies in 1990s. Now it is less than 5,000. So there are worries that number of listed companies has declined. 
And then also there are new developments such as taking into account ESG risk management, new discussion of executive remuneration, also diverse stone boards. So last April, these countries came together in the OECD Corporate Governance Committee, agreed to revise these principles. Earlier this year, I, uh, in February, they have identified 10 priorities, uh, which I, I have listed some of them, again, from uh, uh, ESG risk management to changing uh, ownership structures and digital uh, digitalization. So what we are doing now, we have started the work, the discussions are ongoing. Uh, in, in, in June, in Paris, uh, countries, uh, securities regulators and minister of uh, treasuries, they will uh, discuss their first draft and with a view to finalize it uh, early next year. Uh, for endorsement and, and for adoption. So uh, from an, uh, one, one really particular focus is how to promote companies' use of uh, capital markets, how to promote both equity and bond uh, market financing, uh, but also uh, maybe we, I'm sure we, there will be further discussions on this, but also how to uh, adjust from a climate change perspective. Now, what should be the role of shareholders? What should be the role of stakeholders and corporate disclosure in, in climate uh, change discussion? And one aspect I just want to mention is the ownership structural change. Maybe it is maybe relatively less relevant uh, in the European context, but in a global context, uh, what we have observed is an increase in ownership concentration. Why? Because the increase of Asian uh, capital markets now, you may know that half of the listed companies in the world are in Asia now, and usually they have a concentrated ownership structure, which was not the case, let's say, 20 years ago globally. Also, increased role of state-owned companies in capital markets. And third is a bit of reconcentration of ownership in the hands of large institutional investors in some markets. So in the work, what OECD will be also looking at, what are the impacts of this increased ownership concentration globally on the corporate governance discussion? Thank you. You mentioned, you know, you mentioned climate change, and indeed, one of the biggest things that happened last year, okay, we were all focused on the pandemic, and now uh, uh, the war uh, has consumed, uh, you know, uh, news headlines, but one of the biggest things that happened last year was Glasgow and the commitments uh, by dozens of, of, of more countries to net zero and companies also, eh? huge companies committing to net zero. And this, even before Glasgow, the area of, uh, uh, of green finance was booming and uh, the commitments made there um, uh, incre further added to the momentum. So I want to ask Nicholas uh, to, to, to to talk a bit about sustainable finance and, and what kind of opportunities you see there. Uh, also, let's make it a bit local for Greek companies and, uh, you know, and the Greek state and even uh, uh, sub-state issuers. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll propose to talk about the, you know, the, the international context. I can say a bit about Greece, but I'll turn to you, Vazidiki, obviously, because mm. there's some specific developments here. Um, I think we can look back at the last decade uh, in sustainable finance is, has been probably nothing short of revolutionary. Um, because if you, you know, if I, if I, I've been involved since 2013, 2014, specifically in what's happening in fixed income, and I'll be talking primarily about, about fixed income, so the bond markets and the loan markets. Um, you know, we were, we were talking about one product, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, which is green bonds. Um, and, you know, our target at that time was maybe we were going to reach 100 billion. And the discussion around the 100 billion was, well, even if we do that, it's great, but really what you need is about a trillion a year, um, and we'll never get there, right? Actually, I'm being a bit exaggerating. It was sort of half a trillion. Now, last year, um, the combined sustainable bond markets now, because there's actually several products beyond green bonds, um, exceeded one trillion. Um, and it looks like this year, despite the crisis, we probably will be close. Um, we also don't just have green bonds. We've got sustainability bonds, which is a mix between green and social. We have social bonds. And we now have sustainability-linked bonds. And, and the difference between the first three I mentioned is that they're focused on projects and assets. Um, so they're narrowly focused on, for example, a part of what a company does. And then sustainability-linked bonds, which, by the way, reached 100 billion in one year, 
right? So come back to what I was saying before, you know, we were waiting for five years to get at 100 billion. Well, with this new product, we did it in one year. Sustainability linked bonds allows you to track the commitments of an entire organization. So you're not just focusing on a bit of it, you're focusing on the overall picture. And I, I would say that that's quite a conceptual breakthrough. And what's interesting is it's very much aimed at the real economy. 80% of issuers sustainability linked bonds are corporates. So I could go on about this, but I just say that we really have had a, a tremendous evolution. Now, this is particularly important also if you think in the policy context, because one of the challenges, I think, in, in sustainability is how do you make it investable? You know, how can you take this idea of sustainability and get the markets, and we discuss how they're important, mm -hmm. how we get the markets to actually finance this? And I think that we have, in the fixed income markets, now made very significant steps towards that. If, if we are financing a trillion every year in the fixed income markets towards sustainability, we are making a very significant contribution to financing the transition. Now, and not just the transition, because sustainability isn't just about climate, it's about nature, it's about biodiversity, it's about the circular economy, it's about pollution. But again, let's, let, you know, the primary objective, of course, and the urgency is, is climate um, uh, transition. Now, and I'll, I'll hand over to Vasily Key mm -hmm. in, in a second, but just now where we are is, is a really interesting discussion about, well, what actually is being financed is it, and is it good enough? And in that context, we're having efforts in the official sector, for example, with the EU taxonomy, in terms Very of having right. official categories. And then we're having a debate also about greenwashing. I'll stop there. I'll hand over to Vasily Key. Yes, I, I just want to ask Excuse about me. specifically Greek opportunities eh, that, uh, in, in Greek markets. In the sustainability in, in sector, the, actually. In the sustainability, the green sector. There have been uh, some attempts, let's say, there have been some green bonds and sustainability linked bonds in the Greek market. And of course, the money raised is not like the billions and trillions we just heard. There is no <laughs> comparison to that. There's been several billions. <laughs> yes. But the good news is that. The thing it, is that it started. Yeah, they have it started. started. Yeah. We have started having green bonds. There is a platform right now that the stock exchange uh, uh, started, which actually is going to uh, show to have to present all these green bonds and uh, sustainability linked bonds. Uh, so there is, let's say, that we have started uh, investing in this uh, in this sector. The thing is that here in Greece we have to uh, work a little bit more on the ESG issues in general, because I think this is something that. Uh, the future is now, and we need to, to work on this. We need to work towards the integration of these criteria for, from the Greek companies in order to make sure that they can be investable in the future. Because as long as they start investing now in innovation in, other, in order to get this, to get to the, the, the integration, then they can also become more investable. And the more investable, the, the more, let's say, ERG integration there exists, the more investable they are. Now, as far as regulators are concerned, what we are doing right now, as uh, Nicola said, is that we are working on the implementation, of course, of the taxonomy of the SFDR, which is for the asset managers, on the benchmark regulation, plus there is all this debate regarding how the ratings are going to take place, who is going to be the rater for the ERG. We have sent the, the, all the, 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 the regulators have sent a letter to the commission so there are a lot of open issues that they need to be handled, like greenwashing. We need to make sure that there is no greenwashing and that the disclosure made is made in, in, in a way that is in conformity with all these regulations. And this is very important for us to make sure that the investors that are reading all the relevant disclosure, they are not uh, misled by, by, by the companies. You, Nicola said, that I, I like this expression, making sustainability investable, and I, I, I just want to, take, to get OECD's view on this and, you know, on how, you know, capital markets, what role can they play in facilitating the green, the green transition? How can, you know, and how can we help companies navigate this transition? So, like, uh, of course, uh, capital markets-wise, you know, in almost every big transition, let's say over the last 150 years, from railways, cars, electricity, 1990s, uh, I think uh, the, the, I mean, we people call it dot-com bubble, but as you know, it also financed a lot of uh, IT uh, tech companies and recent. So, from an OECD's perspective, in all uh, big transitions in the, let's say, on the last 50, 150 years in 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 in, in, in uh, market economies, capital markets played a very big role. So also this time, in terms of financing both the green and uh, uh, digital transitions, we need capital markets. Capital markets 
will also play a real role and already playing, but also probably should play a bigger role in financing that transition. That is more how to make, again, how to invest in companies, how to have new companies to develop innovative ideas. But also there is the other aspect of this, a bit the changing the behavior of the companies. That's the, maybe the, the second aspect. And in terms of the, in this revision of the global corporate governance principles, as I mentioned, one focuses, of course, on the climate change and sustainability issues. And we work on based on, a, let's say, four pillars system. One is corporate disclosure. The second is the role of shareholders. The third is the role of boards, company boards. And the fourth one is ro the role of stakeholders. In terms of the disclosure discussion, it, globally, not in the EU, but there's a discussion, as you know, between financial and the double materiality. So financial materiality should be only look from the financial performance perspective or long-term uh, value, but from a financial terms perspective, but double materiality should we also take into account companies' impact on society and environment. What we did in the OECD to prepare the discussion also on this revision of the principles, we kind of mapped all listed companies in the world vis-a-vis -vis their climate risks. And we found that almost two thirds, let's say 63, 64% of listed companies in the world climate change is already a financially material risk. So for at least for climate side of it, maybe E, maybe not, maybe the S entirely, we believe that we should leave behind this financial and double materiality dichotomy or more focus on how to make this happen from a disclosure perspective. Of course, again, then the other item is what should be the role of shareholders in, in, in participating decision-making uh, related to sustainability matters? What should be the role of companies to make sure that this dialogue between shareholders, stakeholders, executives are in place, and also uh, how companies can achieve their sustainability objectives, but also, again, uh, to have an open dialogue with, uh, with all stakeholders. Thank you very much. It's still, I mean, as you said, what is green is like, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new area, it's a new area, relatively new, and it's, it's because it's new, it's, it's still a bit chaotic. Eh? What is green, what is not green? You mentioned greenwashing. And the, the, the European regulation, especially the taxonomy regulation, is trying to, to resolve that. Uh, is it succeeding, Nicolas? OK. <laughs> now, you have to stop me, because I can do 20 minutes <laughs> uninterrupted on this. So I'll, I'll try, to be, try to stay focused. But again, you know, stop me. Um, I've been part of the, the European expert groups that have been looking at this for, for, for almost seven years now. I was at the high-level expert group, I was at the technical expert group, and I'm on the platform sustainable finance. We've had some you know, groups of, of people from the finance side, but also from the policy side. We've had um, NGOs, civil society. So we had a really good debate. Um, and I, I think we are potentially in trouble at this point. Um, and particularly in trouble in Europe, I think uh, there's a disconnect occurring between progress internationally and a rebound on what was said about you know, disclosure rules, you know, single double materiality, uh, sustainability disclosures, TCFD. I think internationally we have some really interesting things happening. We've got in the US market, you know, the SEC is finally stepping into the climate disclosure debate. So I think there's some really interesting things, ha things happening. And historically, Europe's been way ahead in terms of thinking about sustainability in development markets. Now, why am I saying we're about to get into trouble? Because I think that we've had a debate around the taxonomy without really understanding what the taxonomy is. And we have then extended the use of the taxonomy beyond being a classification system to being a tool for product labeling. And by product, I mean financial products. So for example, the EU Green Bond Standard or the Echo Label. And we've also taken it to policy. So we've made it a, a target you know, for European policy. Now, that's a lot, OK? And I, and, and I understand why this has been done. There's a lot of enthusiasm around this. But the problem is, again, I'm not sure that the taxonomy is understood for what it is. And so maybe just for the record, the taxonomy is a classification system based on economic activities, which tells you what is the most sustainable activity today. Now, the estimates of what the taxonomy tells you is today less than 5% of the European economy, okay? Now, there's variance on that different, but on average, about 5% of the European economy is gonna meet the threshold of the taxonomy. Now, that's interesting, that's useful, but when you stretch it to what I'm saying, which is you say, let's say green bonds. If you say green bonds have to be aligned with the taxonomy, 
then you say you can only finance 5% of the economy with green bonds. I'm simplifying, okay? When you say this is, a, you know, this is the target for you know, wider economic policy in Europe, you're, you're, the question is, well, can we take you know, that very narrow definition of sustainability and take the whole European economy there? I would argue you can't. You can take a bit of it. And, and so you know, the problem is taxonomy is a tool. There are other tools. You know, there's a whole reflection on, for example, what is transition, right? And in transition, you've got, well, I can transition from unsustainable to sustainable. So let's say from brown to green. But you've also got transition from very dark brown to lighter brown. And that may only be okay for a certain amount of time. So it's about trajectories, okay? It's about targeting. It's about longer term. It's about sort of 10 20, 30 year objectives. And the reason I'm going into this level of detail is the taxonomy doesn't really do that. The taxonomy, again, is binary. It's more about today. We've been working on making it more dynamic. But fundamentally, I think we have stretched the taxonomy beyond what it can actually do. And the reason this is so important is, again, we've tied so many things to it that we may be in a situation in Europe where we're actually going to narrow down the focus of sustainable finance in the European markets quite dramatically. And, and I'll stop there, I see I've already done four minutes. Um, you know, if you look at the bigger picture, and I'll bring in this concept of greenwashing, because greenwashing has been a legitimate concern of the regulatory and the, and the policy com uh, uh, community. But in, again, I don't know if we really know what we're talking about, okay? Because in the markets, the issue isn't that there are people out there frauding you know, at scale and lying to investors about what they're doing. There's actually tremendous transparency. What's really happening is that there's a range between dark green to very light green, okay? And there's a very good argument to say, is, is light green okay today? That's a perfectly good debate. And you could say, I shouldn't buy that green bond or I don't want to invest in this project because it's just not dark green. No, that's fine. But a light green project is not greenwashing. It's light green, okay? And I think there's tremendous confusion about this because it, when you use the term greenwashing, you think something which is, you know, again, almost illegal, right? You're thinking that there is you know, serious misrepresentation occurring. So what I would call for, and again, I'll stop, yeah. so as you can comment, is I think we need to use better terms. We cannot use greenwashing in the way it's being used, and we cannot use it in an accusatory way. And we have to be very careful about driving policy, particularly in Europe, on sustainable finance, around a fear and concepts, again, which are somewhat misunderstood. Or we're going to go to a situation where this tremendous advance in progress and leadership we've had in Europe on sustainable finance, I think, is going to come into question. I, I was just wondering if, if, if it's a view shared at the OECD that we are overusing the word uh, greenwashing and maybe uh, we are stretching, also that we are in trouble and we are stretching the uses of the European taxonomy beyond its original intent. No, uh, from greenwashing in the corporate governance and corporate finance discussion, what we try to do, at least uh, maybe uh, following also Nicola's advice, we are trying to be more careful using it in a financial consumer protection context. So, of course, again, uh, in, in, I think in that sense, it is a bit of a uh, less uh, kind of limited impact. But the, maybe the problem is uh, this, maybe this perception or uh, that uh, when we say uh, I mean, the greenwashing is used a bit broader, almost everything that we maybe uh, that we don't understand even. I think one reason uh, behind this is that the, the availability of the comparable consistent data you know, on ESG, I mean, one part of the ESG ratings, one part is the discussion of what goes into the ratings, other is the methodologies of rating providers, and what each actually shows us. Of course, usually what people tend to do is to compare with the bond ratings, which is in one way, very, uh, again, Nicola is their fixed income expert. In one way, it is simpler, no? because there is one almost objective. You, you, you try to understand if the, if the borrower can kind of meet their commitments. But in the ESG area, of course, the, 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 the expectations are very different. I mean, some investors are maybe happy that there is a little improvement. Some are more focused on the E. Some are more focused on the S. Many ESG indices are 
highly weighting the G aspect, for example. So it is not. It is also reasonable to have different views, different expectations in the market, and the numbers also show different things. But maybe as uh, today, it is a bit even uh, maybe beyond this that it is at a level that that is confusing, especially for maybe retail investor products that it may lead some misunderstanding that what people are buying or not buying. But I think one problem is really the issue is itself is very complex. And then the, the market for ratings and both development wise and the methodologies are improving. I think this may be the, the main reason, but I think we have a bit broader concerns as of today. Thank you. You want to mention, you want to say about the greenwashing? Actually, I want to say something which is, uh, let's say, what is the objective of the regulator and the regulation as well? For me, even if we, we have a different definition, let's say, of greenwashing or what is brown, what is green, what is whatever, what is very important for the regulation and for the regulators is to make sure that there is, the accurate, there is a correct disclosure of data, the correct disclosure of information, to have accurate information, because this is the number one priority for all regulations, to make sure that the companies disclose the correct information so that the investors are informed, are well informed in order to invest. Because if there is not uh, correct information, then this is the problem in all capital markets. And uh, actually one of the goals of the Capital Market Union is to make sure that there is a, a gathering of information. This is the ESAP, I mean, yeah, and all this to make sure that you have collection of data for all uh, for all the relevant, let's say, uh, investment products that, you, that, there, that exist. So information is number one. And this is what I'm going to mention. It's a very, it's, it's a really long discussion on greenwashing and taxonomy also. Uh, I just wanted to finish with a Greece specific question and okay. with you. And I, I just wanted to ask you as a regulator, uh, what, and what, what do you, where do you see uh, uh, the biggest challenges this year uh, for you and uh, the biggest opportunities for growth in, in Greek capital markets? I think that uh, right now what we are focusing very much is, uh, first of all, we are endorsing all the uh, uh, ESMA and uh, EU uh, uh, priorities, which are, for example, the EAG, the sustainability issues. We are there. We try to focus on this and see how uh, these are going to be implemented by all the market participants. And uh, we are trying to raise awareness on all these issues and at the same time follow the, the, the supervision. Also, we are working on the digital transformation of the Commission because we want to make sure that we have a more, let's say, uh, a digitalized uh, operation and at the same time try to, uh, dig to have a digitalized operation of the ecosystem, of the Greek ecosystem as well. And uh, one of the challenges that we also want to, to see is whether we have to put forward more, uh, let's say, uh, changes, structural changes, in order to have an increase uh, of the, in order to have growth in the market, let's say new products. So one of the things that we want to see and we are elaborating is whether we can have new products. Plus, of course, the, new, the products that exist in the, that the products that are going to have been announced uh, through the capital uh, through the capital market union. For example, the the changes in the LTIF in order to work on on long term investments. So these are very important changes, and we are endorsing them, and we are working on this. Oh, it seems like a very long to-do list, eh? yes. <laughs> and I can only wish you good luck. Uh, this is all we had time for. I would like to thank you for your attention. I know it's uh, laid out. Uh, Mr. Chomokos. Thank you, Nikos. <laughs> I just want to say something. Nikos, thank you very much for uh, chairing so well this last session. Vasiliki, thank you very much. Nicholas, uh, Serdar, thank you very much all. Uh, I don't want to make a speech. I just want we're going to have time to thank the sponsors, the participants, and all the people you know that supported the organization of this event. But I would like to say from this floor here that we started on Wednesday at 12 o'clock with the President of the Republic. We had a lot of angst because we didn't know how the general strike is going to affect us. So I would like only to say a, a, a warm thank you to the 350 people, uh, the technicians, the interpreters, the secretaries, all the people that supported the nine rooms that we used for this conference. Without them, this organization wouldn't be possible to take place. I would like to thank them, and let's give them an applaud to all these people who worked behind us. Ένα μεγάλο ευχαριστώ, το λέω μέσα από την καρδιά μου, στους 350 ανθρώπους, οι οποίοι δουλέψανε, στηρίξανε, 
Μοιραστήκανε το άγχο μα, το λέω με κάθε ειλικρίνεια. Ήταν φίλοι μα δίπλα και σύμμαχοι και χωρί αυτή τη βοήθεια ήταν αδύνατο να το ολοκληρώσουμε. Σα ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. 26-29 Απριλίου του χρόνου εδώ. Σα ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ όλου. Να είμαστε καλά. Thank you.